Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This will be part two of our talk on the basics of dermatology, and I do recommend watching the first part before watching this part. As I mentioned in the previous video, it's very important to have down the basics before you go on to think about the abnormal side of things because it will just help solidify everything. Uh, you know, if you go and try to memorize the abnormalities, the disease processes, but you don't have a good underlying grasp of the basics, you're really just going to be memorizing stuff, and I don't think it's a very efficient way to study for tests. Now, if you are getting ready to take step one, you're going to find some of this stuff very useful because I go over some slides, some uh, histology, and that is tested on step one, especially as it pertains to pathophysiology, where you have to look at slides uh, of, of, of diseased tissue. And so you really need to have the histology down because if you don't have that down, you're not going to have any idea what you're looking at. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can get there by clicking the link below in the description of the video or in the i button on the upper right hand corner of this video, and it should link you up. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies, formulating a differential diagnosis, treatment plan, things that will come in handy for you for step three and for clinical practice. And, you know, just a dollar a month goes a really long way in helping to keep these videos free. I really appreciate your consideration. So we're uh, in the pre previous video, we pretty much talked about skin. Now we're going to talk about some of the accessory structures, hair, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, and nail. I will add in a little bit of pathology, you know, being an MD, I can't get away from disease. And so I'm going to put in a little bit of stuff to hopefully make this a little bit more entertaining and relevant to you. But as I said, very good to focus on those basics and then work your way up from there. So the hair follicle is at its basic nature, a tubular invagination of the epidermis. And from that, uh, that specialized epidermis, uh, the hair grows from the stratum corneum, and so really it's just keratin. And hair is made up of dead keratinocytes. Some structures of note uh, that you'll hear thrown around is the hair shaft. That's what we know as the hair. And there are three parts to this that you'll see histologically. The cuticle, which is the outer part of the hair shaft, uh, so relatively internal, uh, but the outer part of the shaft itself, and this provides structural support and it's continuous with the inner root sheath, which is a distinct uh, structure that you see histologically. There's also the cortex and the medulla, not very consequential here. The dermal papilla is an invagination of the dermis into the hair bulb, which is you know consistent with uh, the epidermis. And doing what the dermis does, it provides circulation to the hair follicle. Remember that the epidermis has no circulation. It can only get its nutrients through the dermis and through diffusion of nutrients that way. The hair matrix is a layer of keratinocytes that produce the hair shaft, which then grows. The sebaceous gland is an apocrine gland that produces sebum. And then this goes into the hair, uh, along the, the, the hair shaft. And it is a substance, sebum is a substance that lubricates the hair shaft. It's really the product of a sebaceous gland. And we'll talk more about sebaceous glands themselves uh, in subsequent slides. And the erector pili muscle is smooth muscle, which attaches from the hair follicle at one end to the papillary dermis on the other end. And this is under sympathetic control. And you may be aware that the erector pili muscle, when it contracts, not only does it cause hair to stand up, it also results in a dimpling of the epidermis. And so when you get scared, i.e. your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, you get that dimpling of the skin, which causes goosebumps. You'll also notice that this when you get cold. When you get cold, uh, it will cause the erector pili muscle to contract, uh, which helps your hair warm you up or reduces the amount of heat loss and that's why you get goosebumps when you get cold as well. This is a cross-section of multiple hair follicles um, so you can see uh, that these hair follicles are all embedded in this kind of tissue here. What kind of tissue? What is all this stuff in this tissue? This is fat. You can typically tell fat because fat washes off when you uh, take when you make your uh, histologic specimen. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of white. 
Um, that's not actually fat you're looking at, that's just nothing. Uh, the fat washed off. So what tissue in the skin is full of fat? That's going to be hypodermis, which stores fat. So the, the, these hair follicles are in the hypodermis. So it's probably pretty low down because the, the hair bulb actually rests in the hypodermis. Uh, so that's good to know. These are all just a bunch of hair follicles. You can see that the actual hair itself, the shaft of the hair, is embedded uh, inside these follicles. Now this one doesn't have one, probably just because it fell out. Now this is a cross section, again, of a single hair follicle. Uh, you don't need to memorize all these parts unless you're in medical school right now taking a histology course, uh, then you might want to <laughs> memorize all this. Uh, but you can see the medulla of the hair, uh, which is uh, approximately surrounded by the uh, cuticle um, and the uh, cortex, and then uh, together along with these surrounding cells, it's known as the uh, internal uh, root sheath right here that surrounds the cuticle. Um, the cuticle makes up sort of the external part of what we know as the hair itself. So the medulla is of, of the hair is where the pigment is stored, and then the rest of it kind of surrounds it, but you can't really see it uh, when you're looking at a hair, but it does extend with the hair uh, itself. And then you have the external root sheath, and then around that is a glassy membrane, which just serves as the basement membrane, attaching it uh, uh, within the, uh, the skin. Um, the rest of this stuff is just accessory structures. You see here some sweat glands. These are eccrine sweat glands, which make a sort of watery sweat. We'll go into sweat glands in a little bit. This is a longitudinal section here. So you can see this is the bulb of the hair, the, the very base. And right here is the dermal papilla. So this is an extension of dermis. And what does dermis have that epidermis does not have? It has circulation, it has vascularity, and that's necessary for these cells down here to grow. These cells are part of the hair matrix, and the hair matrix gives the cellularity and ultimately gives the keratin that makes up the hair. So these cells are alive. You may often hear that hair is dead, and that's true. It is made up of dead cells, but at the base of the hair, it's very much alive, and so it needs circulation. Uh, down here for the hair to ultimately the these cells to grow and proliferate and then uh, ultimately die off and form the uh, the keratin that uh, that makes up the hair itself. So this is what's known as the hair bulb, basically at the base of the uh, hair follicle. This is another real good picture here. Uh, you can see uh, here we have the bulb. It's embedded in the hypodermis. There's a, some sweat glands here. Uh, and then here you can see a sebaceous gland. We're going to go into what sebaceous glands are in a little bit. Um, so lots of, of different structures you can see here. This is really nice, kind of low resolution, but it's a really nice picture. Another really good picture here. Um, okay, so here you can see, I didn't mention it, the erector pili muscle you can kind of see here. And then here you can see it again. Remember the erector pili muscle just attaches the, uh, the hair follicle unit uh, to the uh, the dermis. This is the sebaceous gland here. Notice the duct uh, emptying into the hair canal. And remember that provides that sebum, that nice uh, uh, sort of waxy material uh, that lubricates the hair and makes it waterproof. Uh, you can typically tell a gland because it often has uh, these really uh, sort of vacuolized uh, uh, structures and makes the, the cells look very clear. And I apologize, my dog is barking in the background. Uh, so again, here another good uh, view of the sebaceous gland. And you see another one here, the gland down here, the duct emptying into the hair canal. Uh, you see a little bit of artifact here. This is not hair. Uh, the hair is, is gone. Uh, so, oh, the real good picture here of erector pili as well. This is muscle. Remember, the erector pili is smooth muscle. Okay, you see some of the other structures as well. Uh, together, the sebaceous gland and the hair itself are known as, as the pilosebaceous unit. Pilo coming from the word for hair, sebaceous meaning sebaceous gland. Uh, together, it's known as the pilosebaceous unit. So you may see that word thrown around. 
So one of the big diseases of the hair follicle, although we don't know if it's only the hair follicle or if it's even the hair follicle at all, but I figured I'd put it in here, is a disease called hidradenitis suppurativa. And this is a chronic multifactorial disease thought to arise from occlusion of the hair follicle or maybe the apocrine gland, or maybe both, or maybe neither, we don't really know, uh, but it's probably one of these two. Um, and that occlusion then results in a bacterial infection followed by inflammation, a very painful inflammation. And so what happens is that these people, they're chronic, or they're, they're, they get this chronically, for some reason they're predisposed to it, and they get this painful eruption, and uh, it shows up uh, externally as visibly inflamed papules. And the reason we think it may have something to do with apocrine glands is because this tends to happen in areas that are rich in apocrine glands, so namely the armpits and genital regions. Like I said, the exact pathophysiology is unknown, but we do know that people have a genetic predisposition. So again, that we think it may have something to do with the apocrine glands uh, starts from the fact that we know that this tends to start on around puberty. And so androgens play a role in apocrine gland secretion. Um, and so uh, you probably know this because, and we haven't talked about glands yet, but apocrine glands uh, are what cause the sweat underneath your armpits. And that's obviously why you get BO. So if you're you know, sweating on your palms, you're sweating on your forehead, that doesn't stink. But the apocrine gland uh, sweat, that really smells. Uh, and it smells because it's got protein in it and you get bacterial growth. Uh, there, but uh, so you think of all the areas that sweat that smell while well, your armpit sweat smells genital regions if you don't clean down there that will start to smell but not so much the the sweat the sweat that comes off your back or your palms or your forehead um, that's because this is apocrine gland uh, that are sweating. Um, so anyway, hydradenitis suppurativa tends to occur around the apocrine glands. Uh, it may be triggered by Intense sweating, topical products like deodorants can clog up uh, these structures, and certain medications like hormonal contraceptives can uh, lead to this. Obesity is an aggravating factor, probably due to the fact that they're going to sweat more uh, because they're overweight and get a little bit more friction. Uh, it doesn't cause the hydradenitis suppurativa, but it can make it worse. So this is what hydradenitis suppurativa looks like. It really looks kind of like acne, like little pimples. Um, this is an armpit right here. So again, you see this guy here. Um, he's got uh, the, uh, the lesions here around the armpit. And here is uh, in the genital area, uh, you can see here, pretty bad. It gets uh, really inflamed. I actually uh, get hydradenitis suppurativa, not very bad, not very often, but I had it for the first time when I was 15 years old. We were at Disney World, we're doing a lot of walking. I was sweating, had it right here, kind of on my thigh, upper thigh area. It was pretty painful. So my mom thought I was chafing, but uh, we went to the doctor. I had to get on antibiotics uh, for this. And I'm not, a, I'm not a heavy person, so this can happen to relatively lean people as well. All right, so going into exocrine glands, we're going to talk about a few different exocrine glands, but I just want to go over uh, sort of the different kinds of ways we can classify exocrine glands. We can classify it structurally, so simple, meaning just a single unbranched duct, and compound, meaning a branched duct, and I give you some examples here. There's different shapes, so obviously there's tubular, which is long and cylindrical. Um, these uh, are sweat glands, are, are tubular glands. And then there's asinar uh, glands, which are kind of sac-like, and they're very short and round, and this is what you see in the thyroid. And then there's the mechanism of secretion. So we're going to talk about eccrine and apocrine. Eccrine is also known as miracrine, and these are products that are released by exocytosis, so the cells pump out the product. Apocrine is where the product is released through membrane budding. So they, they come out from the cell in membranes. Uh, and that's going to be useful for distinguishing the apocrine and eccrine sweat glands. You'll be able to see this on histology. And then there's holocrine glands. This is how sebaceous glands work. Uh, holocrine means that the whole cell ruptures during release. So apocrine is kind of in the middle, and then you have eccrine, which is just exocytosis. And holocrine is how sebaceous glands work, so that's good to know. 
So of the sweat glands, uh, they're both tubular uh, exocrine glands. They make sweat, which is a liquid substance primarily intended for thermoregulation. They do a few other things, but uh, primarily for thermoregulation. Of the sweat glands, we have two different types, eccrine and apocrine. The apocrine glands are a little bit bigger, as we're going to see. Uh, as far as location, eccrine glands are pretty much everywhere with the exception of the lips, labia minora, glands, penis, and a couple other areas. The apocrine glands are, again, uh, kind of are around that axillary, areolar, which is uh, kind of nipple area, and anal uh, regions, kind of groin. Uh, the site of opening for eccrine glands are on the skin surface, uh, whereas for apocrine glands, it empties into the hair follicles and then exits that way. It comes out uh, where, where the hair comes out. Uh, and you don't have to have hair in that area. So women who shave their, their armpits, their hair may be gone, but there's still hair follicles there. Um, likewise, um, you know, you can, uh, even if you don't have hair in an area at all, you can still sweat there. Um, so it comes out the follicles, but you don't actually have to have visible hair. So I just thought I'd point that out. The, the discharge of eccrine uh, sweat is watery, very little protein, mostly just chemicals, water, sodium chloride, urea, uh, NH3, and uric acid. So this is not going to be eaten by bacteria, and that's why it doesn't stink. Apocrine sweat, on the other hand, is very viscous. It's got some protein in it, and therefore it's odor producing. Now the sweat itself is not smelly. It's when the bacteria eat it uh, is when it becomes smelly. So you're smelling the bacteria and you're not smelling the sweat. Um, so innervation for eccrine glands, mostly cholinergic. Um, and this is going to be most of your sweat for thermoregulation. Apocrine is mostly adrenergic. All right. So, uh, so here's some eccrine sweat glands. Notice that they're a little bit uh, narrower. Uh, smaller, um, and, but the uh, and, and you can tell this if you know if you're just looking at the gland itself. The reason you can tell it's narrow is because the cell makes up most of the gland. Uh, and we're going to see on the other hand, apocrine glands. The cells are the same size, but you can see, you'll be able to see that the lumen of the gland is much bigger. Okay, so these are eccrine sweat glands. You see them pretty much everywhere. So now on the other hand, apocrine glands. Uh, if you just look at these two, you can't tell how big they are, but if you look at the size of the cell, the cell is going to be pretty much the same size in both glands, but the lumen is much bigger. So these are bigger glands. Another way that you can tell that these are apocrine sweat glands is you can see that budding. Remember that apocrine, uh, apocrine glands release their content through budding of the cell, and you can see the little buds coming off the cell. You don't see that in the eccrine sweat glands, which, remember, release their products uh, by exocytosis. And just remember, exocytosis starts with an E, eccrine starts with an E, there you go. Apocrine glands release their contents through budding. So here's a comparison. You can see here, um, not a huge difference. You know, some of these glands are a little bit bigger, although you're probably looking at more of a cross section here. Uh, but if you look here at, uh, or sorry, longitudinally, but if you hear, look here at a cross section, you can see that uh, most of the diameter is made up by the cell, so they're fairly small. Apocrine glands, on the other hand, you can see much wider diameter. Cells are about the same size, but the, the, the lumen is bigger. And you can see some budding here, and you know it's a little bit harder to tell at, at uh, lower magnification, but uh, there is some budding going on. So eccrine versus apocrine. Uh, one of the disease, diseases of sweat glands is known as Fox Fortis disease. Now, this is very rare. However, if you're taking USMLE Step 1, you'll want to know about this one because Step 1 is known to test on rare diseases. So this is of unknown origin, and what happens is that the apocrine sweat glands become blocked for whatever reason, but this is a non-bacterial inflammation. So this is different from hydradenitis. Uh, this is a uh, non-bacterial inflammation, so it's not really painful. It just gets a little itchy, and you start to see these these uh, little uh, papules, but they they don't look angry. They're not red. Uh, they're just a little inflamed. It causes some itchiness, and again, because these are apocrine glands, they're going to occur on the armpits and genital region, and for whatever reason, they're worsened with heat and humidity, probably because that activates the apocrine glands to sweat. 
So this is Fox Fortis disease. You can see obviously a big difference from uh, that really red, purplish, angry appearance of Hidradenitis separativa, but this is very itchy. And so because it's itchy, you can get a little bit of bleeding because you're, you're uh, damaging, you know, you're breaking these papules. Uh, but for the most part, it doesn't look really uh, inflamed. Um, there's just some minor inflammation and some itchiness. Okay, now moving on to the sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are simple branched holocrine uh, acinar glands uh, that secrete sebum. And sebum is an oily lubricating substance, which we alluded to earlier. And sebaceous glands occur pretty much everywhere except for the palms and the soles. They play a big role in lubricating the hair, but they also, uh, you know, lubricate skin. And, you know, if you don't take a bath for a while, you might notice some oiliness on the skin. That's probably from the sebaceous glands for the most part. Largest concentration on the face, scalp, chest, and back. And that's going to be useful to know when we talk about diseases of the sebaceous glands. It's associated, when it's associated with hair, it's called the pilosebaceous unit. And there's some specialized, unique sebaceous glands that when they occur in certain areas, they have unique names. So sebaceous glands along the eyelids are called meibomian glands. They're just sebaceous glands, but they have a special name. So meibomian glands. Sebaceous glands of the penis or vulva are called fortis spots, probably the same guy who named Fox Fortis disease. Uh, and again, you see these uh, very frequently. Pretty much everybody has these sebaceous glands often visible. Uh, and then they occur very prominently on the areola. They can get pretty big. And, uh, and uh, so if you're looking at a female breast, you'll really notice these along the areola. Oh, this is me. I went to uh, Peru about a month ago and uh, hiked up and uh, camped a little bit in the uh, Peruvian Andes. Um, this is actually the Rainbow Mountain. This is not where I, I camped out. Uh, but I went, and normally I shower twice a day. I'm pretty uh, fastidious. Uh, but I went about 36 hours without showering while I was camping. And I just noticed this greasy film in my hair. That was all sebum, but it is pretty nasty. So this is at the top of Mount Winnicunca, uh, also known as uh, next to the Rainbow Mountains. And uh, it's about 15,000 feet above sea level. Uh, and these little alpacas are kind of cute in the background. It took about four hours to hike up. It was quite the workout. Okay, this is a sebaceous gland. Now remember, there is a sebaceous gland that can be associated with the hair follicle, but not all of them. So this is a sebaceous gland that's emptying straight out into the skin. Uh, so you see dermis here, uh, epidermis, uh, and then this is just emptying straight out into the skin. Uh, so this is uh, a sebaceous gland here. It looks a lot kind of like a salivary gland when you look at the cellular appearance. Uh, but it's just, this is a sebaceous gland. And you'll know because it's it's this uh, sort of uh, purse-like uh, gland that empties straight out into the skin. That's a sebaceous gland. Uh, the sweat glands are going to be more tubular. This is kind of sac-like. Some diseases of sebaceous glands. The big one is acne, acne vulgaris. And this is a condition that involves blockage of the pilosebaceous unit. Uh, followed by secondary anaerobic bacterial infection, um, typically, um, well, I'm not going to go into the microbiology here, uh, results in erythematous papules, pustules, and or nodules. Everybody's seen acne. Everybody's gotten a pimple every now and then. Uh, so you should know what this looks like. Uh, usually it occurs in regions that have the largest concentration of sebaceous glands. So face, scalp, chest, and back. Remember I told you about sebaceous glands? They're in higher concentrations in certain parts of the body. Well, that's why you get acne in certain parts of the body. How often do you get acne on your, you know, your forearm? Not very often. How often do you get acne on your feet? Not very often. But face, scalp, chest, back, that's where most people get their, uh, their pimples when they get them. Because androgens increase sebaceous gland activity, acne vulgaris is more prominent during certain conditions. During puberty, Skin's not used to all those androgens. Glands aren't used to all those androgens. All of a sudden they hit puberty, they've got androgens, they're going to get acne. That's why teenagers, often you see them with acne. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, increased androgens. Acne is one of the uh, common findings of PCOS, along with um, changes to the period, irregular periods, uh, changes in the hair. Uh, they often get... Uh, get uh, hirsutism, etc. Congen congenital adrenal hyperplasia, not very common, but you can get acne from that. 
and then anabolic steroid use or abuse, acne, very common. Another one is seborrheic dermatitis. This is a condition involving regions with high concentrations of sebaceous glands. Symptoms can range from mild dandruff. Dandruff really is just seborrheic dermatitis, very mild seborrheic dermatitis, uh, to varying severities of erythematous papules, very characteristic greasy yellow scales. And this can get really, really bad. So this can look really nasty. Uh, but characteristically, they have these greasy yellow-gray scales, which often dry up and flake off, very similar to dandruff. Uh, the pathophysiology is not completely understood, but it's thought to be possibly due to an abnormal immune response to malassezia, which is a fungus. Uh, when it occurs on the scalp of an infant, it's known as cradle cap, and that's probably due to the fact that these babies still have some circulating maternal hormones, and that's resulting in activation of the sebaceous glands. Very commonly happens on the scalp. When it happens elsewhere on an infant, we just call it seborrheic dermatitis. Cradle cap is not a, a medical term, but you hear it thrown around. So here you see seborrheic dermatitis. Not really bad here, uh, but you see those very prominent uh, yellow gray uh, uh, yellow gray crusting scaling uh, and if you were to rub this the stuff would fall off very readily so you can see here that it can get a little bit inflamed uh, so you see the redness uh, but again you see the yellow gray uh, flaky stuff that you can see how flaky it is it's coming off onto the hair here uh, so that's a good way to tell seborrheic dermatitis you may not see the scales everywhere but you should see it somewhere uh, and if you ask the patient you know when you rub it do you see flakes falling off, if they say yes, it's probably seborrheic dermatitis. This stuff's typically not going to bleed, it's just really itchy and, you know, can be a little painful at times. Here you can see it again on the scalp here, it can cause some hair loss if it gets really bad because of the fungus. Um, you can see here uh, the, the, the flaking. So there are other fungus that you can get on the scalp. Uh, this is the only one though that's going to cause that yellow-gray flaking, seborrheic dermatitis. Here's cradle cap here. Okay, so moving on to the nail, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the nail because there's not a lot of really important things that go on here. There's one really common disease of the nail that we will talk about, uh, but I don't want to spend too much time uh, with the nail. So the nail is really just uh, specialized hair, really. Uh, it's modified stratum corneum. Uh, of the epidermis, uh, so very similar to hair. Uh, it's just got a, a much denser uh, keratin to it. Some structures of note is the nail bed. This is a specialized epithelium which contains all four layers of the epidermis. The nail root, again very similar to the root of the hair, uh, is the proximal part of the hyponychium which is the tissue beneath the nail body and it houses the nail matrix, again analogous to the hair matrix. Uh, where the stratum basale cells, remember those are your live proliferating cells in the epidermis, will proliferate and that results in lengthening of the nail and ultimately this is going to be transformed into a very hard keratin. And then there's the lunula and if you look at your fingers you'll be able to see that little uh, crescent shaped region and that's just because it's thickened. So it's no different than the, the nail surface itself, it's just thickened so you can't see the underlying skin. Uh, so uh, if you look here, you can see the matrix of the nail, the very root. This is where the, uh, the lunula is right here, um, and then the body of the nail, um, and then pretty much uh, all this other stuff isn't associated with the nail. One big disease of the nail that will come up on all your steps is onychomycosis, and this is basically just a fungal infection of the nail caused by trichophyton, which is, again, a fungus. Uh, and this occurs underneath the nail in the nail bed, and it results in a yellow-brown discoloration of the nail. Um, very, very, very common. Uh, so if you see yellowish-brown color underneath the nail, it's almost always this fungal infection. Uh, in severe cases, it can result in separation of the nail from its bed, and that uh, typically, typically when that happens, you're not going to be able to replace uh, the nail. So this is a very mild onychomycosis. So if you look here at the big toe, you can see some yellowish discoloration. The other uh, toenails are fine. Often this happens 
in the toenails, not in the fingernails. It can happen in the fingernails, but often happens in the toenails. Why? Because you wear shoes and socks, you have, uh, you're have you going to have more fungal proliferation there uh, because it's dark and moist, whereas the fingers are, uh, you know, you're not typically wearing gloves that often. Your fingers are in the nice aerated areas, light. Um, you don't get as much fungal growth that way, but fungus love to grow in dark, moist areas. Um, and so... Typically, uh, the, the, the feet are easier for the fungus to grow. And, and the, uh, the fungus migrates from the skin underneath the nail, where it then continues to proliferate. This is very severe onychomycosis. You can see it in all the toenails, um, and you can see that it's really eaten away at the nail there. So onychomycosis. And that is all I got for you. So now we've done a total go through of the, um, the integument. And so we're ready to go forward with some specific diseases and treatment uh, of those diseases. I'll see you next time.